very conspiratorial uh, and all that kind of stuff. And then a few weeks later, I got a phone call or an email from, I think, a reporter in the Netherlands who basically told me the same story. And I looked at that and I said, whoa, yes, indeed, yes. You know, I look at this. Yes, definitely, these are PAP uniforms. You know, I can see a lot of, you know, distinct, distinctive uh, identifying markers there. And I'm, I'm saying, boy, would they really do that? Then I looked again and I said, hmm, but what's wrong with that uniform? What's wrong with that uniform is it was supposed to be a picture taken in 2008. However, in 2005 and on, they, the PAP had been issued these badges that they wore over their chest and these kind of badges on their arms. However, if you look at, oops, let's go back. If you look here, they don't have those badges. They don't have everything there. And I said, well, that picture was taken prior to 2005. And the Chinese government actually came out at about the same time and said, yeah, you know, these guys don't have the right uniform on. And in fact, what they were doing is they were being, they were props, they were, um, you know, additional players for a Michelle Yeoh movie that was being filmed in Tibet. <laughs> these were extras. These were extras. The, uh, the reporter from the Netherlands said, oh, no. Now it means I have to rewrite my story. So, you know, they wanted to find the conspiracy. Okay, strategic intentions. Here what I'm going to do is these are just quotes from the, in, they're, you know, I mean, they're just taken directly out of the white papers. Every year, or every other year, since 1998 up through 2008, so now there's been about six of them, the, uh, Beijing has issued a white paper on national defense, and each year they tell a little bit more of the story, and uh, they can be very tedious reading, but they tell, I think they define pretty much what this the national strategic intentions of the Chinese military and the Chinese military modernization are, are all about. They have been very consistent with this over literally decades. China will never seek hegemony. Well, what does hegemony mean? You know, we don't use that word. But basically, it means dominance. You know, it's, and this is not just dominance in Asia, but world dominance. Now, you know, they, they say they're not going to do it nor engage in military expansion, uh, no matter how developed it comes. To me, that's a pretty clear statement of strategic intention. Also in the white papers and other statements you'll see, them say China does not form military alliances. China does not have and station troops overseas in military bases. I can look and I can say, and I look and I can say what they have said is is true. I don't see that, okay? We can talk about string of pearls, if anybody's familiar with the string of pearls concept. Perhaps the lady reading proceedings over there might be. Um, but, uh, you know, they say these things. These things that they say, I can oftentimes go out and I try to double check it on the ground and I find that, you know, granted there may be the big lie in there at times, but a lot of what they say like that reporter's surprise actually turns out to be pretty true. Second, they, China pursues a national policy, or policy that is defensive in nature, strategically defensive in nature. Now here's the big catch. It looks to protect national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Sovereignty and territorial integrity this can be dicey because China has ter conflicting territorial claims with, you name it, Korea, Japan, Philippines, Malaysia, whatever. Uh, so they, but they, they define what those areas are. But in, and in general, you know, that's where the friction, if there's going to be friction, China is doing in the world is where those overlapping territories
territorial claims uh, rub against each other. But I think they're pretty clear this is what, that's the purpose of their military. And in 2006, and then just last year or this year when they released it, they laid out this modernization schedule. And they laid it out with milestones 2010, 2020, and finally mid-century, i.e. 2049, the 100th anniversary of the um, founding of the PRC. What they mean here is they are looking to basically complete their modernization where they feel confident that their military could go out there and successfully prosecute a local war under what they call informationized conditions in the 21st century. So I think a few years ago <clears throat> they thought they were doing a lot better than they were doing. And then they started looking at the progress that they made and they started to pull in the reins a little bit and said, hmm, we better go back and look at some basics. And so there, right now you see a lot of this reference to, you know, really 2049. Now, 2049, that's also enshrined in the CCP Constitution, the Chinese Communist Party Constitution, as the goal when they want national economic development to take them to the status of a mid-level power. Not a superpower, a mid level power. And often when they talk about what is a mid-level power, they talk about something, oh, something like Germany. Okay, they're not talking about superpower. They talk, when they talk, what they want to do, they want China to become what they call a dog wall, which is a big country, a great country. They don't use, we use the term superpower, that they, they intend to uh, become a superpower, but they don't use that term. They, um, <clears throat> They are, shall we say, a little bit more modest in what their professed overt goals are. And in order to uh, focus or perform this defense modernization, we need money. Now, from 1970, the mid-70s on, uh, you had what they call the four modernizations. Four modernizations in China were number one, agriculture, number two, industry, number three, science and technology, and number four, military modernization. Military modernization has always been the last of the four modernizations. What this chart here shows is just the way the G Chinese GDP has grown over those years. Unfortunately, actually I've had to multiply by 10 just so you can see it on the chart, uh, how the defense budget has grown. The next chart will show it a little bit better. But you can see the defense budget has grown, and then roughly in about 94, 95 time frame, it started picking up in the, the slope, the, the annual increase. But at the same time, the GDP has grown much, much faster. What they have always talked about since 1978 is that national economic development is the nation, economic development is the nation's primary task. Everything else must be subordinate to that task. And they specifically say that defense development should be subordinated to national economic development. Since 1998, roughly 2000, they've also been talking about the coordinated development of national defense and economic development. And from about 98, maybe a few years after or before that, you started to see the increase in defense budgets go up. You know, the, average annual increase 12 15 percent this does not this is not um, corrected for inflation and some of the during some of these years they did have some inflation which in some years the deflation which uh, affects the, the slopes there but the important thing is during the first decade of modernization from 78 to roughly 88 there was hardly any growth in their defense budget. I mean, it stayed flat. In fact, in a couple years, it dropped from the year before. What was happening in the United States during this time? This was the Reagan defense budget growth. You know, when we were literally, in this time, we put trillions of dollars into our defense, while the PLA at that time was also four million men strong. 
was get, you know, this is roughly less than $10 billion per year. In 1994, roughly, it was about $6 billion. Well, in fact, this is much lower than $10 billion, but in 94 is roughly by then exchange rates about six billion dollars per year per year and it's been growing now so this year 2009 is now up to in US numbers this is the officially announced defense budget about 70 billion dollars per year at exchange rate and um, all this data here comes out of their most recent white paper and they have a chart that shows all those numbers specifically. And I, it was too big, so I just cut out uh, some five-year increments up to 2003. But this just gives you an idea of how fast the GDP was growing for these years, whereas the military budget was not growing so fast until you really got into the mid-90s. the mid -90s. So they had almost a decade, or they had a decade or more of almost stagnation in the growth of their defense budgets. And so what a lot of what we're seeing today is making up for lost time. And again, I'll just, without getting into purchasing power parity, are we familiar with purchasing power parity ideas and all that kind of stuff? And, but these are exchange rate uh, evaluations. But basically their GDP last year was somewhere in the range of four Four trillion, whereas our GDP was about 14 trillion. And then when you include our defense budget plus all the war supplementals and stuff in 2008, our defense budget was roughly in the range of 700 billion. In that same year in China, it was roughly 57 billion. But as we all know, the officially announced defense budget does not tell the complete story. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think the Chinese know exactly how much their total defense-related spending is. I, I spent a couple, several days, a couple years ago with a, a group of Americans and we tried to talk about this and it was, it was a frustrating However, if anybody's interested, we did do a big report that uh, uh, defined a lot of what we knew. And what we know is that additional funds uh, for the Chinese armed forces come from three major sources. Number one, the central government. For example, many uh, or much of the equipment that is being bought from Russia is being paid for by funds that come out of the central government, not out of the PLA budget. Uh, last year, that number was down to about a billion dollars. Previous years had been up, a few years before that, had been up $3 billion. So uh, that's just one example of how these numbers change year to year. Uh, other funds that the central government uh, provides are some education expenses, R&D, research and development, some research and development expenses. Local governments also provide money that goes to support the reserves and militia and also, for example, those People's Armed Forces guys that act as recruiters and uh, uh, direct the reserves, command the reserves. Those guys are paid for from local governments. And then the PLA also adds money to uh, its own coffers by, it grows a lot of its own food. Every company out there, every army company has a little garden. And you know, most of the Chinese soldiers are gardeners, or farmers, and they know, they know how to grow, grow tomatoes. And so they grow tomatoes and raise pigs for, for their own tables. And they also, if there's any excess, they'll sell that out on the open market and they'll use that money to buy extra whatever computers or whatever they need. And sometimes they are even authorized to sell land uh, that they own. And there's been a lot of that going on, uh, and they've been trying to uh, keep that under control. Uh, but the PLA adds to this. The, the big problem in estimating the defense budget is that uh, these numbers from these three sources vary from year to year. And you just cannot say, 
Chinese defense budget is actually two times bigger, it's actually three times bigger, it's actually ten times bigger, it's whatever. You, if you really wanted to make an estimate, an accurate estimate, you'd have to figure out how much each of these funding streams are for each year and then add it all together and look at it. And um, I, had, I know this is a big problem in uh, the intelligence community uh, and oftentimes we just literally pull numbers out of the air uh, and, and multiply. And then what happens is the press reads the number. Well, the Chinese said their defense budget was 57 billion, but the Pentagon says it's actually two to three times that. And so what the press says the, generally is the Chinese defense budget is three times, you know, it's, 100, it's you know, 140 or whatever, 160 billion dollars. Well, in the Army, we used to call that a wag, a wild-ass guess. And that's really what it, a lot of what it is. And uh, the big conclusion of our report was we just don't know how much they're actually spending. Uh, we'll try to get through some of this quickly so we have some time for questions. But one of the big differences between their military our military is their leadership. This is their national command authority. Our national command authority is the president and the secretary of defense and the combatant commanders, uh, down to the combatant commanders. The Chinese uh, society is very much uh, focused on cons consensus building and uh, agreement and making everything and making sure everybody's, number one, on the same sheet of music and everybody understands what's going on. Well, this, these 11 men up here, this is their central military condition. This is the highest level of military leadership in the country. In the middle is the president, secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Hu Jintao, and also chairman of the Central Military Commission. He is the, the chairman but he is one of the 11. Now, he may have a bigger voice than all these other generals, and these other generals are the most senior generals in the force, uh, but they really do do things by consensus. They have long meetings, and they talk about things, and they make sure, and they argue back and forth amongst each other, but when, when Hu Jintao says something, Really, what it's, it is is the Central <coughs> Military Commission saying something. And these guys here, and some of these guys are 65 years old, roughly, um, but these guys all get together and meet regularly. And what's interesting, when we talk about jointness, it was only, it's only been in the past five years that they've started adding the commander of the 2nd Artillery, the Air Force, and the Navy to this leadership committee. Prior to that, those guys may be, but usually weren't in part of part of this, uh, this commission. Now this chain of command, this chain of command came off the Chinese website, the PLA Daily, and it shows very accurately their senior level chain of command. There's a lot we could talk about here, but there's a couple things that I'd like to show you. Number one, Okay, here's the Central Military Commission. Okay, over top, these are the general staff departments going down to the Navy Air Force, some senior military schools, and then what they call, the, they call military area commands, we call military regions. These are the operational forces here. Seven military regions, all in China. None of them extend beyond the borders of China, all in China. But here is the Ministry of National Defense, the equivalent of the Department of Defense or the Office of the Secretary of Defense. What does this guy command? He don't command nothing. Okay, the Minister of National Defense this guy here gets his power from his seat on the Central Military Commission. But as a uh, Minister of Defense, he's not in command of anything. 
So our Secretary of Defense, you know, may technically have a counterpart in him, but he's really not the same kind of thing. He doesn't have the juice that our Secretary of Defense has. And then what you see here, this is the Central Military Commission through the general staff departments, general logistics, general political department, commands the forces, and then also down here, commands the People's Armed Police. Over here, the State Council also exercises command over the People's Armed Police. Actually, under the State Council, not shown here, is this Ministry of Public Security. And this is what we mean, the dual command for the People's Armed Police. Again, we could talk a lot more about that, but we just don't have time. These are the military regions. Uh, again, as you see, all in China. Uh, some of these are joint, well, they're all joint in that they have Army and Air Force. Some of them actually command some naval units. Not all naval units, not all Air Force units are under the command of the military regions, but generally these are administrative joint headquarters. And again, very different from every level and this is a company, about 100 people, all the way up to military region. You have both a commander and a political commissar, and each of them have deputies at every level all the way up. And this commander and political commissar are jointly responsible for everything that unit does or does not do. In our army, only the commander is responsible. They are both the commander and what we call the PC are jointly responsible. Uh, the political commissars have assistance and also within each unit from company on up they have party committees. While the commander is responsible for military affairs in the party committee, the political commissar is the secretary of the party committee and he has the most senior party members in the company and then from all the way up. And whenever possible, what they try to do is all sit around and talk about things and make sure that they all know what they want to do. Now, in a tactical situation, if they need a decision like this, the commander will make that decision and everybody says, yes, sir, yes, sir, and they go out and do it. But most of the time, what they really want to do is make sure that everybody understands the mission. Political commissars do a whole lot more than just take care of the political reliability. And they are part of all this something that they're trying to work for called integrated joint operations. What they are trying to do, this is a new term, it's really, in my opinion, it's really joint operations. And joint operations are something that include the elements of all the services acting together. Uh, all the new equipment, old equipment, everything acting together in concert to uh, achieve a goal. You know, you can read all this stuff and give sort of ideas of what integrated joint operations are. But what's very interesting, they also talk about this military strategic guideline of active defense also talks about people's war. People's war. Mao Zedong. Mao, back in the 30s, de defined people's war. Fifteen years ago when I was in China, I was predicting the death of people's war. I think I was wrong. In 1999, when they came out with a new doctrine, people's war was all over it. We need to understand what they mean by people's war. Um, and we haven't done a good job of looking at it, yet they've written quite a bit about it. Also, another thing that we have not done a lot of investigation into is their concept of deterrence. In 2001, they wrote this book, um, The Science of Military Strategy, in Chinese. They then translated in 2005 in English. The English version was, came out. They sent hundreds of these books to um, an organization, the Center for Naval Analysis, or CNA, and they asked CNA to distribute these things because they wanted the American people to understand their doctrine. This science and military strategy is one of the textbooks they use in their military schools. This is what their military officers read and how to think about strategy. Chapter 9 in this book 
talks about strategic deterrence. This, co uh, this quote here comes from the white paper, but for years, if you look at it, look at all the writing, they talk about deterring, preventing war, all that kind of stuff, but they're talking about what we, our concept, the same idea of, of deterrence that we have. Yet most of the time when we talk about Chinese deterrence, we talk about nuclear deterrence. It means much more than that. To them, both war fighting and deterrence are major functions of the military, of the armed forces. And this comes right out of here. War fighting is used only when deterrence fails. Deterrence can accomplish strategic objectives. And the more powerful the war fighting capability, the more effective the deterrence. And this is what they're doing. They've been working now for the past 10 years very assiduously to improve their capabilities to have a credible force. This book and many other Chinese articles, I, you know, I've got examples in my book, of articles that talk about deterrence and deterrence requiring three things. Number one, a capable and credible force. If you don't have a capable and credible force, then people know you're bluffing. So they need to, you need to have a force out there that can actually do something. Then number two, you must show the determination to use that force. And they do that by military parades, such as they had in Qingdao just uh, a month ago, April 23rd, on the 60th anniversary of the founding of the PLA Navy. And we'll, they'll have another big parade October 1st, the 60th anniversary of the founding of the PRC. Military exercises, all these things show determination in, in by their doctrine show determination to use that force. And then third, you have to communicate so the other side, the side to be deterred, understands that you have this force, you're determined to use it, and they say, yes sir, we've got the, I've got the idea. And I, in my opinion, for example, the anti-satellite test from two and a half years ago, in January 2007, was, in my opinion, uh, partially uh, a deterrent operation. One of the interesting things they talk about is China's integrated multi-level concept of de deterrence, both nuclear, conventional deterrence, and all that, people's war, adding into there. In this book, they also say the day of space deterrence is not far away. Hmm. Guess what? It came on 2007, January 2007. Also, too, uh, since about 2002, they have very clearly said in their official documents that their goal, of, uh, one of their goals in military modernization is to deter further steps from of Taiwan from moving toward independence. So deterrence of Taiwan independence rather than forced reunification is again defined as uh, a stated policy goal. Okay, now where do they think they are in all of this? And I'm almost finished. Since January 2006, I found three to four dozen, 30 to 40 examples of almost exactly these same words written in official Chinese documents at, you know, I mean, very authoritative Chinese documents. Most of the time, these words are found in articles that, are, that talk about, oh, we've been working so hard for the past 10 years and we've really made a lot of progress and we've got to keep on working. And then there's always this but. But, now and for a long time to come, i.e. till 2049, our modernization level is incompatible with winning a local war. Well, what that means is not that if they had to fight, they wouldn't fight, but it means they are not yet ready to integrate all the missiles and the electronics and the Army, Navy, Air Force. They're working to integrate it, but they know it's going to take a long time for them to do that. But we're not really ready for prime time yet, is what they're saying. And then our military capability is not yet ready 
for all these historic missions. And when they talk about historic missions here, I believe they're talking mostly about the non-traditional security missions, anti-terrorism, uh, security of sea lanes of communications, all that kind of stuff. In, in fact, disaster relief. After the Siswan earthquake last year, they were very clear in saying, boy, we did not have enough helicopters, we did not have enough he heavy lift aircraft, IL-76s, you know, they use all of these things to learn and to improve. So this self-assessment, like I say, has been repeated about 30 to 40 times in the Chinese literature, mostly buried inside these long articles. And I have found only exactly, count one, two instances of this assessment applying or, or being written in English. Um, people, when I brief people often about this, they say, oh, well, this is just China's, self de er, China's deception operation. Uh, they're telling you that they're not ready. And I say, well, if it's a deception operation, I'm the only one in the United States that's being deceived. Because <laughs> literally, no, very, there's a handful of people that have actually, I think, looked at this. But this is the general and uh, self-assessment. There are, like I say, dozens of examples of this. There are even dozens more of lower level assessments about their logistics capability, the capability of their officers, the capability of their, or the, the size of their funding. They keep saying, boy, we don't have enough money. Uh, the state of their technology. But all these other Smaller self-assessments about training, boy, our training really sucks. You know, our submarine commanders can't do what they need to do. Our battalion commanders, because they don't have any staff, can't do what their battalion needs to do. All those assessments lead to these big, this big assessment. And this big assessment is, has been attributed to Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao, and when Hu Jintao says it, that means the Central Military Commission says it. This has been in a lot of Communist Party uh, n not only military uh, journals, but also Communist Party journals. They are telling their government, hey, hmm, you know, we've still got a long way to go. We're willing to do it, but we've got a long way to go. So what this says to me, this assessment is actually very consistent with the Chinese doctrine, if you read it. But it also suggests to me that they are certainly well aware of where they are and the gap that exists between their capabilities in the United States and knowing this self-awareness going way back to Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, know yourself and know your enemy and in a thousand battles you will be victorious. They're saying to me that they know themselves, know themselves. By knowing themselves and where they stand and these gaps Contrary to what is often the conventional wisdom here, that uh, the PLA leadership is very hawkish and pushing to take Taiwan or you know, go into the South, South China Sea and be very vigorous. It says to me, well, man, when they're sitting around in that Central Military Commission, maybe those generals, not all of them, are jumping up and saying, yeah, 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 send me out there, send me out there. I think they know better. They know that they've got a long way to go. But because they are a party army, if, if the military or if the civilian leadership tells them to do something, they're going to salute and say, yes, sir, yes, sir, we're going to go out and do the best we can with the um, forces and capabilities that we have. This book was also written for civilian leadership so that the civilian leadership can know a little bit about what uh, goes into the decisions into, to go to war. I know the military has read this. I don't know that if the, the civilian leadership has read this. And as, well, the civilian leadership, if they are not aware of military strategies and things, you can, Civilian leaderships can get countries into big strategic problems by going to war at certain times. Um, like I say, 
they, the Chinese are just as prone to that as any country. So at that point, um, I will finish here. And uh, if anybody can identify this guy, let's go out and get an ice cream cone afterwards. But uh, we've got a few minutes. So uh, first of all, I want to say to Dennis, thank you very much. It was really comprehensive. <laughs> analysis, but this thing speaks for itself, and it's a cold